Zoom recording button and show subtitles. Okay. Um, before we start, some of you have attempted the practice exercise for set theory and I've looked at those who have done it and there's a couple common mistakes that I'm seeing, particularly in question two and particularly in the very last question for the power set. And these are the two biggest mistakes I've seen. For elements, uh, we cannot just group multiple elements together in a nice package. So for instance, if we have a set A that just has like say A and B together, we can say that A is an element of A and B is an element of A, but we cannot just say that uh, this set A and B is an element of A. You know, we, we can't just group those together nicely uh, because again, if we say that that set, the set containing AB is an element of A, we're saying that that particular object, the set containing AB is in the set A. So there's no real trick to, to doing those together uh, to, to package them up nicely, uh, just so you're aware. And with the power sets, uh, watch your brackets. A lot of the people who are getting the power set question wrong, it's because you're just missing like one pair of brackets on one of your elements. Uh, so just be careful for that. Like for instance, if you have this set G and it contains something like uh, the set containing X, remember you're asking yourself, if you wanna add this to a set, so if you do add it to a set, you end up with something like that. And in the end, you're adding this to a set in the end. So you might get an extra pair of brackets than what you're expecting. Uh, so that's just my little advice from what I've seen so far. Only about half of you have attempted it. And most of you who have not got over 0.75 haven't finished all five of your attempts yet. Um, but just in case you're getting those questions wrong and you're like, where am I going wrong? Uh, try the process for the power sets and also for this first element question. Uh, we just can't take little shortcuts like that. Um, but before we start set laws today, are there any questions from the past couple of lectures that you have on your mind that uh, you'd like answered? Yes. Yeah. Um, so about like elements in a set, kind of what you just drew on the slide here. So if you had like a set with more than just two, like if A set A was like A, B, C, and D, then if, if you wanted to ask is X an element of A and you wanted to ask if A, B, C, and D, you'd have to do them individually. Yeah, so we'd have to say okay. A is an element of A, B, C, and D. So these would all have to be separate. Okay, so it's because the minute you put the curly brackets around any combination, it becomes a set. Yeah. So within, okay. Yeah, so if I were to say then that A, B is an element of A, what I would need to see is I would need to see this particular object in that set A. Okay, but that's different than subsets. Yeah, so... In this case, if I were to say, uh, let me just make space here. Uh, so that's A. I would say that the set AB is a subset of set A because I can find this element A in here and I can find this element B in here. So okay, so when it subsets, the curly brackets don't necessarily mean it's a set. It just means like this, these, these, these elements. Yeah. Yeah, okay. a subset is different. So a subset is like I can circle A and B in here, therefore those elements are part of a smaller set within A. Okay, I think I get it now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's very common to have some confusion at the beginning when dealing with elements and subsets, so that's why we have some questions on both to begin with. Okay, again, if you have any more questions, you can just interrupt me as we go on, but uh, today we're starting with set laws and that's how we're gonna finish set theory. And typically this is sort of the scariest part of the first lecture, um, but there's no real reason to be scared of this. Um, a lot of this notation wise is a little terrifying. And when we take a look at the 
what we're doing with it, it's a little bit terrifying. But in terms of natural language, um, this isn't actually that bad um, compared to what it looks like. So uh, what, what are you looking at is, is really the first question. Um, we're looking at a bunch of equivalent sets. So sets that mean exactly the same thing. Uh, we learned a bunch of set operations, and this is just uh, ways that we can simplify sets or change sets. So sometimes you're given a bunch of uh, really complex sets, like I could say A, a intersection B, uh, A intersection B complement. And I might be asked to find uh, you know, everything in the world that fits into that complex set expression. And that could take a long time to do by hand. But if I understand you know, some, some ways that I can take those sets without actually computing the elements inside and just understanding some general laws about how those sets work, I can manipulate those sets before even going inside of them and simplifying them, changing them to something simpler that I can work with that will take much less time. Uh, for computers, I mean, they can just go in and they can work with the sets and come out with some sort of answer and list notation very quickly, uh, depending on how many sets they're working with, of course. Um, but with humans, even having four sets like this can take a lot of time. So if, if I can just take a look at this and I can say, oh, this is equivalent to everything in the universe, this saves me a lot of time, uh, you know, for, for humans at least. So these, all these set laws are really just um, different ways of, of simplifying sets in, into sets that are easier for us to work with. So there's a lot of different laws for us to use, and some of these are more intuitive than others, and you're not expected to memorize these, of course, that would be absurd. So this is just a nice little list that you can have beside you at all times to reference, but I'd like to explain some of these in terms of natural language. Uh, usually how these are introduced and how I've introduced them in the past is you have these little Venn diagrams like we've done before and we say okay this is A and B. So for instance we have something called the commutative law and I'll just show you how this works with the Venn diagram first to show you how I've explained this in the past and then I'll do it with natural language which is something that linguists are more familiar with of course. So if we have A intersection B what this means is that this refers to the intersection where A and B are. So I can say this is the Venn diagram representing A intersection B. And I can draw another Venn diagram with B intersection A. So this is B and A. So it's the same thing, but the circles have been flipped. And I say, okay, this section in between corresponds to B intersection A. And I can say that because both of these Venn diagrams correspond to the same shaded section, whether it's A intersection B or B intersection A, I can say that these two sets are exactly the same, which means that whenever I see A intersection B, I can flip it with B intersection A, and they're the same. Now, this is one of those sort of obvious things. It's like with uh, three plus two, it's the same thing as two plus three or three times two is the same thing as two times three. It's called commutivity, and in mathematics, it's the same thing with three plus two and two plus three. You can commute them. And we typically demonstrate these things with uh, you know, these Venn diagrams. But natural language is just as nice. So uh, with natural language, we can say something like, uh, I want to find uh, you know, someone who's uh, happy and tough. So this is like A intersection B, or I wanna find someone who's tough and happy. Okay, these, these are equivalent in natural language, happy and tough or tough and happy. And we can do this with or as well. I want someone who's happy or tough, or I want someone who's tough or happy. It doesn't matter how we order these words. Uh, they mean exactly the same thing. So this is called commutivity. Uh, we can change the order of the sets that we have. And uh, like I've mentioned before, when we talk about sets in terms of natural language, uh, we can refer to adjectives or nouns. Uh, that's fine. 
uh, those are sets in natural language, the set of all things that are happy, the set of all things that are um, people. These are examples. So if you have A intersection B, you can change it to B intersection A, A union B, you can change it to B union A. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna call these A and B or A or B. So instead of intersection, I'll say and, and instead of union, I'll say or, just to make this a little bit easier to say and to make that connection with natural language stronger. So that's commutivity. Uh, associativity just happens to do with, uh, with the brackets. And what's important with associativity is that all of the signs are the same. So this is A and B and C, A or B or C. So it's just which two sets are being associated first. So if I say, uh, you know, uh, cats and dogs and mice, or am I saying cats and dogs and mice, uh, which ones are being associated with each other first? In natural language, it doesn't matter uh, whether we say cats and dogs first and mice after or uh, dogs and mice first and cats after. It really doesn't matter. And this is the same thing with the word or. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot fit the word or there. Otherwise, it will bleed into it. Um, but that is associativity. Um, which words associate or which sets associate together first? Uh, distributivity is a little bit more complicated, and distributivity happens when the signs flip. So this is when we have an or and an and. So uh, let's try this one with natural language, and we'll see this is a little bit weirder. Um, Let me first let, let me first do this with math. I, I want to illustrate this with colors before I do this with text because with text I can't just change the color on the fly. Um, okay, so again, I want to try to avoid as much math as I can, but this is this is a uh, very late middle school math, so please please forgive me for this one. So you may remember, you can do something like three times uh, two plus one. And there's two different ways that we can solve this. Uh, either we can do the two plus one together first, and then we can end up with three times three, which gives us nine. Or we can do something called uh, distribution. And what we can do is we can do three times two, and then we can add it to three times one. So what we end up getting is something that looks like this. And I'm keeping the colors together on purpose. So we end up multiplying three times two, and then we add it to three times one. So you'll notice the signs are different here. Three times two plus one gives us three times two plus three times one. And this is just like taking different operators in terms of set theory. So if we have three and two or one, this is like saying three and two, or three and one. And if we take a look at our distributive law here in the third row, we'll find that this works exactly the same, uh, whether you have a different law or not. So although I haven't explained this in terms of natural language yet, that's a nice way to illustrate how the distributive law works. Um, so let me just think of an example here. Uh, happy or sad and quiet. So this doesn't, okay, so if you're happy, yeah, let's do happy and, sad or quiet. Let's, let's not use sad. Happy and loud or quiet. If we say someone is happy and loud or quiet, then what does this mean? They're either hap they're happy and they're loud or they're quiet. 
then they're either happy and loud or they're happy and quiet. They're one of those two things. They're one of those two pairs because we're saying they're happy and loud or quiet. So we get this distribution here. They're happy and loud or they're happy and quiet. So if I can underline these two here or I'll box them. Again, like I say, with the, with the text, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't quite illustrate as well because I can't change the color easy in this program. Um, but we can sort of see the same sort of distribution there. Uh, happy and loud or quiet becomes happy and loud or happy and quiet. It takes the same distribution as the multiplication on the right. Uh, does that not make sense to anyone? Or are there questions or concerns or comments about the distributive law in this case? This works anytime that the signs are flipped. So it's really common when I see people use these laws that the associative and distributive laws get confused and people just switch the brackets around for uh, associativity when it should be distributive. Uh, so just keep an eye on those two. If the signs are different, use distributive. If the signs are the same, use associative. Now you might say, well, when do I use these? We'll see them in a second. Uh, the rest of these laws um, are, I can be illustrated a little bit better with the Venn diagrams, but I'll still try to keep on with natural language. So identity laws. Um, identity laws, I guess you can think of the set operations too. So we did see a little bit of these with set operations. So identity law basically just says, if you put in a set A, you're going to get back that set A. So A union the empty set, this is like saying A or nothing else, I'll get A back. Or A in common with the universe, I get A back. So let me demonstrate. I'll just demonstrate these with Venn diagrams because I think it's the best way I can do this. Um, if I take A union the empty set, well, I get everything in A and I get nothing with the empty set. So I just get A back. That's the first identity law, A union the empty set. Uh, if I take A intersection with the universe or A and the universe, I get everything in A and then I get everything in the universe. So what do I get in common with A in the universe? Well, I just get A back. So uh, the identity laws give us A back. With the domination laws, it's sort of the opposite. So the domination laws basically say that the special sets uh, the empty set and the universe dominate over whatever set we give it. Uh, so if we give it set A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever set we give it, the empty set of the universe will dominate. So if we take everything in common with A and the empty set, well, the empty set has nothing in it. So we're always just going to get the empty set back. So if we take a look at the Venn diagram here, I mean, there's nothing in common with A and the empty set. So the empty set dominates. If we take A union the universe, well, we're taking everything in A or everything in the universe. So we get our universe back. So the universe dominates over the set A. This is like saying, uh, I want dogs or everything. Well, dogs is included in everything. Uh, Complement laws. I'll illustrate the complement laws with little Venn diagrams too. So here's A, here's A complement. If I want everything in A or everything in A complement, what I get back is the universe. I'm taking in everything in A or everything in not A. So I get everything. That is our first law. With the second one, a intersection, not A. I'm saying I want everything in A. I want everything that's in both A and not A. Well, uh, these are separate things. So that's A. Uh, this is not A. 
there's literally no overlap because something cannot be, say, a dog and not a dog at the same time. So what I get is the empty set. There's nothing in common. Uh, if I want to take everything in a complement complement, we can think of this as, say, not not a. And this is like saying uh, basically just a itself. So everything in not a is this outside of a. And then we take everything in not not a, which just gives us a back. OK, and the last one here, which is more of a definition, sort of a nice thing to use, is that if I take a minus b, this is really just the same thing as taking a and b complement. So again, the definition is saying I want x in a, so everything in a, and everything that's not in b. OK, so. Notice we have and here, x is an A and x is not in B. So this and corresponds to the intersection. And when we say x is not in B, this is really like saying that x is in, oh, this is covering my cam. Let me just move that out of the way. That'll be easier. x is in B complement. This is like saying that x is in, not b. So this is sort of a definitional shortcut. And there's only one rule for the set difference sign. So if you ever see an a minus b, we can just change that to a intersection b complement. And then we can get rid of the minuses. And we don't have to deal with minuses. So this is why I say that we don't really need a set difference. We can just deal with it in terms of intersections, ands. Uh, finally, De Morgan's laws. Uh, De Morgan's laws people show with set uh, with Venn diagrams, but the Venn diagrams get quite messy. So let me just uh, show you this with natural language. Okay, and I will move my face in a place that's never been before and just mess up my entire screen region. Okay. So De Morgan's laws has to do with negation. So I can say not A or B. And basically I'm negating a pair of things. So let me turn this into an actual thing, uh, an actual like phrase. Like, uh, you, so using A minus B complement law, then you can use De Morgan's. Uh, not quite. So, okay, so if I go A minus B, what I end up with is A and B complement. With De Morgan's laws, what I'm using is I'm negating an entire pair. So De Morgan's is saying not A or B or not A and B as a pair. So it's negating both of them. It's sort of like the structure that we saw earlier in the first lecture where we're saying not A and B. While this case, with the complement law, uh, what we end up with is uh, A and not B. So a little bit different. So De Morgan's is more about this not a and B structure that is right below me. So let me give you a sentence example. Uh, if I say something is both not blue and red, neither blue nor red, this, this is perhaps a better way to phrase this. What this means is that something is not blue and not red. So this is equivalent to the structure of not uh, B or R. And what I've converted it to is an equivalent phrase of not B and not R. 
So this is an example with natural language that expresses the Morgan's law. Uh, neither blue nor red is the same thing as saying it's not B or R. And I've changed it to something equivalent in natural language that says it's not B and not R. So what the Morgan's law does, uh, if you want to think of it just symbolically and not in terms of natural language, uh, you can think of it as, okay, I have, I have sort of three different symbols going on. I have set symbols, A and B. I have a union or intersection, and I have a complement. What it does is it takes the complement, it distributes it inside, so I get A complement and B complement. So it takes whatever the sets are and it makes them into the not sets. And it takes whatever the sign is, union or intersection, and it flips it. So ors become ands and ands become ors. So in this case, A union B complement becomes A complement intersection B complement. And that's exactly what's happened here. Uh, not B or not R has become not B and not R. Okay, so um, that was a bunch of laws. And I do not expect you to have understood all of these in the 20 minute time frame that we went through these. Uh, I don't expect you to have understood all the explanations <laughs> for all of those in 20 minutes either. Uh, nobody does. Uh, but that was a little whirlwind tour of the laws. Uh, so when you have A minus B, the furthest it can be simplified is only with complement laws. Uh, in that state, yeah. If you just have A minus B on its own, uh, A intersection B complement is the furthest you're going to go with it. It's only within like a more complex set are you going to be able to simplify it further. In fact, if you have A minus B, you might not have to simplify it further. Uh, at these stages, like if you just have A union empty set, simplifying it to A is fine. Um, but if you have A minus B, that might be the furthest form that it even needs to be in. So um, I want to show you now what these laws are used for in, in a more real context. And I mean, this will look scary at first, but I show you the laws and then I show you why we use them. And now you have a reason to go back and actually take a look at the patterns. And now when we look at the patterns here, you're not just totally lost. Okay, let me move my cam back to... Uh, my happy place, right over the slide number. Okay, so let's say we get a set like this, uh, A union B union, and then B intersection C complement. And I want to simplify this as much as possible. Uh, and I want to give this some sort of meaning. So let's say I want to take a look at the computer and I want to find all the things that are either uh, happy or dogs or um, not uh, dogs and cats. So I want to find all those things. Now, that seems like a huge pain in the ass uh, for me as a human. For a computer, maybe not so much. Um, but if I'm a human, I don't want to do that. So instead, what I want to do is I want to take that set and I want to apply some laws to them and see if I can make it into something simpler for me to work with because that's a lot of writing that I have to do. So I'm gonna take all the different laws that I know, and I'm gonna to try to work with these sets and uh, change them around based on the laws and see if I can simplify them. Now, what you're looking at here is a step-by-step -step process of simplification. And the first step you have, or the first thing you're thinking is like, oh, that's a little scary. And the second thing is this, might look doable and the third thing is probably okay but how do i do it so i'll walk you through this and then we'll go through some strategies and um i'll let you do one for homework uh well not for homework on your own and i'll post the solutions online but i'll give you some strategies and uh, the first time you do one of these it does take a while and that's okay so i'll sort of illustrate what i've done here and i'll talk why i've done these things so whenever I see a complex set, uh, the first thing that I do is I look for these pairs with 
complements outside of brackets. Uh, and the reason I do this is because there's only one law that ever deals with these types of sets where you have a complement outside the brackets. And those are De Morgan's laws. Um, if we have a complement outside of brackets, we cannot deal with them uh, with any other laws. We cannot do associative, complement, commutative, domination, any of those. So we have to get those complements inside the brackets. So the first thing I do is I take a look at B intersection C with the complement and I do De Morgan's law so I can get those complements inside. So that's what I do. And uh, the complement goes inside on C and B and then that intersection is gonna flip to a union. So I can either think about this in terms of natural language and say not dogs and cats becomes not dogs or not cats, or I can just go to the table of laws and reference them and apply them. Really doesn't matter. Uh, at this point, the Morgan's law is done and I just see a bunch of unions. So everything is unions now. I have a bunch of ors, A or B or B complement or C complement. Uh, this is my dream. Everything is ors. So the brackets don't mean anything to me because everything is the same operator. So I can just use the associative law and the commutative law to my heart's content. Because when all the operators are the same, I can move things around as much as I want. So I didn't really need to write these two steps, but I'm just showing them. I'm showing I can move the brackets around so I can get in the end B or B complement together. And this is like saying, I want the things that are dogs or not dogs together. Dogs or not dogs. And what do I know about dogs or not dogs? Well, if I want the things that are dogs or not dogs, I get the entire universe. And that's what I've done here. I got the entire universe. So I've replaced dogs or not dogs with everything. And because I've got everything, I now have I want everything or not C. And in this case, uh, I've said C is cats. So this would be I want everything or not cats. Well, what do I know about uh, taking uh, not cats or everything in the universe? Well, I get everything in the universe. So once again, I make that replacement with the domination law and I get A or universe and end up with the universe again. So I got really lucky in this proof because I ended up with a case where really this entire set right here, this complex set is really just the same thing as this entire universe. So in the end, there was A, B and C. Uh, there was this complex way of putting them together uh, but really, at the very end, uh, what I was looking at was just the entire universe. So I did. So did I need to deal with this thing with that was uh, happier dogs or not dogs and cats? No. What I was really looking at in the end was just everything. So as a human, it's easier to deal with. As a computer, I wouldn't care. But as a human, I, I care a lot. It saves me a lot of time. Okay, um, so yeah, what I've done in the next two slides of is, is I've written out these tips in actual words and given you suggestions because uh, these proofs, there's no one correct way to do them. Uh, it's more of a heuristic rather than an algorithm and a heuristic is a strategy rather than a set method of doing them, which means that they're a little bit more painful to learn because you have to be creative. You have to try things out. You have to fail and you have to struggle. Um, but before that, uh, let me just emphasize two things about these proofs. Uh, first of all, when you do them, uh, you structure them the same way I've structured them is that you have a line, you number them, you write out the line. And then when you go to the next step, you write out which law you've used to change it. So you don't have to change the color of what you've done. I've just changed the color here, if you can even see it, uh, to show what I've done to illustrate to you what's changed. Um, but you just have to write out the law to show me like which law you've used. That's really it. 
Okay, uh, so I'm going to show you some heuristics and strategies, but are there questions about this process? Um, can you draw the Venn diagram for the original um, the expression so that I can see how it ends up with the union? Uh, oh, yes. Let me, let me try this one. This is, I'll be honest, this is something I have not attempted yet, but it is doable. Uh, so this is A union B. Uh, and then I want everything that's not in B and C complement. No, I want, so union B and C complement. So this is B and C right here. So I want everything outside of that. So I want uh, all of this. So that's all the stuff I'm looking at, which ends up to be the same thing as the universe. So basically the green is A union B and everything outside of this red circle is B intersection C complement. So I'll just highlight that, these two areas. So, I mean, yeah, with a Venn diagram, visually, you could draw it too. But uh, with more than three different sets, it's going to be very difficult visually to do. Like for, for two-dimensional drawing reasons. Okay. Uh, so here's some strategies for these. And again, let me just... Get my face out of the way. So some general strategies. And, and I've actually shown the process here. So the first one is whenever you see the set differences, change them into intersections. And I haven't just done like F minus G. I've done this in, in a context where there's F minus G and something else going on. So in this case, if you see F minus G, change it to F intersection G complement. Uh, that way you can work with it. You cannot do anything with the minuses, with the set differences, but you can do things with intersections. So if you have F minus G, change it. Uh, if you have a double complement, so if you ever see those two complements side by side, uh, just get rid of them. You don't need them. Uh, two, positive, or two negatives make a positive. So simplify it, uh, make it easier to deal with. Uh, otherwise, if you don't do that, you're going to be doing De Morgan's twice and you're going to be distributing. So you'd be getting like F intersection, G intersection uh, with a complement and you're going to get that twice. Uh, and then you're going to be doing the same thing again. You're going to have to get rid of the double complements eventually. So just get rid of them when you see them. Uh, if you ever see like, uh, a or not A, or A intersection, not A, uh, just simplify it. Change it to either the universe or the empty set. If you can get something down to the universe or the empty set, do it, because you'll be able to use the domination or identity law over and over again. Um, the universe and empty set are very powerful tools in your set laws, because they will simplify a lot of things. Uh, there's three more. Um, the domination law is a very powerful tool, like I said before, or like I, you know, like I said before, like I just said. Um, and these can be used with more complex sets too. So uh, we saw things like a intersection, the empty set gives you something like the empty set. Um, but this can be complex. So this can stand for something like uh, P intersection Q. So when you see just A, it can stand for something in brackets. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, I don't know if there's too many cases in this course where you'll see that, but there might be one or two. Uh, if you ever get stuck, if you ever get stuck, uh, watch out for the distributive law. Check to see if you have opposite signs, like an or and an and outside of brackets, uh, because that's usually the next step that you have to do. And then the last one is whenever you can use De Morgan's law, use it. Uh, this is one of those other parts where people get stuck when they see a complement outside of brackets, and then, and then they can just distribute it inside. And usually that's the point where you can keep on moving forward. Uh, but again, uh, these are heuristics. This is a strategy. So uh, there's one on the on the assignment that you have to do. There's one on the slides, which I will post solutions for. And let me check the lecture page because I do have some more practice. I'm just not sure if I uploaded them on to Canvas or not. And it seems like there's not. So let me show you the lecture page. Because I do recommend doing these. Uh, on the lecture page, I've done like an intro one for you where I've done one of the proofs. And this is one of the questions where what I'm asking you is to identify the law. So this is like a first step practice where you're just looking at someone who's done a proof and you're trying to identify what law is being done. So this is a good first step. Uh, I'm going to upload another set of practice questions where you can do some proofs yourself that have full solutions. So before you have to do the actual assignment, uh, you can do some other practice proofs um, because you need more than just one, obviously before you can do an assignment. So I will put out an announcement with that attached, uh, just so you are aware. Um, so I will put out the solutions for these on Canvas along with the announcement. So that should be out later tonight. Um, but do please uh, try this one on your own later. And I'll give uh, one little bit of advice for these as well. And that is when we say something like show that two laws are equivalent, uh, you do not need to go in only one direction. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you get stuck in one direction, it's okay, for instance, to go backwards. Like you can say, okay, uh, I did as much as I can going down, but now I want to start from A intersection B minus C and go up. And eventually there will be some point in the middle where the two sides are equal. And you can do this because set laws are equivalent. Uh, the left side is always equal to the right side. They go in both directions. Uh, in a discrete math course or in a law or in a philosophy course, they might care a little bit more because they're more rigorous, but uh, we take some things for granted in linguistics, and one of the things that we take for granted is that these are just completely equivalent, and we don't need to, to prove that rigorously. So you can do them in either direction. Uh, usually it's easier to do that from left to right because of the way that I set up the question, um, but if you get stuck, you can go in both directions. So before we move on, are there any questions about set laws or the entire purpose of set laws and why we have them? Does that mean we can work on both sides at the same time? Yeah, you can if you want. Uh, okay, I shouldn't say the same time. Uh, when you do one line, just modify one side. So um, when you apply a law, change just one side at a time, but you can change the left side in one line and the right side in one line. That's okay. I'm not bothered by that. 
uh, just make it just make it clear to me. Um, I do recommend though, uh, check out the lecture page as well for another example and some more examples of individual outcomes for the laws if this is still confusing. Um, if you did pick this up in just the 40 minutes, that is incredibly impressive, but that's something I don't expect. That doesn't happen. It's not normal. Okay. Um, and again, if, if the set laws are still a little bit like, why are we doing them? Uh, another key word is, remember, this is just like paraphrasing sentences, paraphrasing sets of nouns and adjectives and descriptions, simplifying descriptions that are more complex in nature, uh, un unnatural descriptions, really. Okay. I would have done like the set question, but uh, I do want to make sure that we get enough information so that way you get uh, the info for your assignment uh, at least a week to do the majority of the questions. Uh, so we'll do ordered pairs and then we'll take a break. Okay, uh, ordered pairs. A a after set laws, the rest of this lecture will seem a little bit more relaxed for sure. So ordered pairs, uh, everything from now on in the relations and functions lecture. So this is the lecture four. Um, this is now about verbs. And in some cases, the preposition. Well, really the preposition too, but our focus is not the preposition. Our focus is the verb. Uh, intransitive, transitive, and ditransitive verbs. So... Uh, we need to start with the concept of an ordered pair and ordered list. So any list of objects is called a sequence. So um, in math, you might think of like a sequence of numbers. So for instance, the sequence of numbers from smallest to largest, let's say one, two, and three, we would just write it in parentheses, one, two, and three, or you might see them in angled brackets. So angled brackets, one, two, and three, uh, either or, uh, you can write them either way. Uh, I like the parentheses because they're less messy, um, but the angled brackets are used too. My problem is when I write the angled brackets fast, sometimes they look like sevens and that's a little bit difficult to write. Uh, if you think of the vowels in order in English, you could think of A, E, I, O, and U. That would be the sequence. Uh, in a sequence, order matters. So one, two, and three is not the same thing as two, one, and three. So in sets, it doesn't matter what the order is, but in a sequence, order matters. Now, when we have uh, some specific number, we call it a tuple. So if you have two things in a sequence, like AB, it's called a two-tuple, or in normal words, it's a pair. If you have three things, like say 32, 65, 11, it's a three tuple or a triplet. Uh, after a triplet, normally we drop the terms like quadruplet and quintuplet. You can still use those terms, um, but typically after that, we just use six tuple, seven tuple, eight tuple, and so on. So MKETK2 is a six tuple because there are one, two, three, four, five, six things. And what you'll notice in ordered pairs as well, or ordered six tuples, is that the repeated elements count. So in sets, they didn't count. When you saw a repeated element, you just tossed it out and you didn't count it. But in tuples, the repeated elements do count. So we see K here twice, and it counts twice. So that's an important difference with the ordered tuples. Okay, last thing before our break. So if we have two sets, A and B, uh, I'm gonna draw these here. Actually, I'm gonna draw them down here. A and B. We can define something called the Cartesian product or the cross product. And what this means 
So we put a little multiplication or cross product symbol in between them. And this gives us pairs of elements. So this gives us pairs A, B, where the first thing comes from A and the second thing in our pair comes from B. So here's an example. We're saying that A contains zero and one. And we're saying that B contains A and B. Okay, and I wanna create the cross product of A cross B. So what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a set of things. And specifically, I'm going to get a set of pairs. So I'm gonna get pairs where the first element comes from the set A and the second element comes from the set B. And it's gonna be all possible combinations. So I can get one pair where I get zero from A and A from B. So I could get the pair zero A. I could get the pair where I take zero from A and little b from b, so I could get zero b. I could get the pair where I take one from a and little a from b, so I could get one in a. And I can get the pair where I get one from a and little b from b, so one b. So basically, it's all the different combinations of pairs, where if I have a cross b, I'm taking the first thing from a and the second thing from b. So the order here matters. So if I change this, I've now changed this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, B cross A. If I do B cross A, well, I'm essentially flipping the sets that I have here. So what I can do in my little diagram up here is I switch B and A around. Uh, B has A and B. A has 0 and 1. I do the same thing. Uh, except the first element comes from B and the second one comes from A. So now I get the, pay, the pair A and zero. Then I can get the pair A and one. I can get the pair B and zero, and I can get the pair B and one. And now these are all the pairs of B cross A. Now, what in natural language does this? Well, think about Subjects and objects in English. Uh, if you have a verb, the subjects and objects matter. Uh, so for instance, if I say, uh, let's say for simplicity, if I have uh, a kid, if I have say kids attack adults and the, the, the kids are the subjects and the adults are the objects, if I flip this, to be adults attacks kids. Well, if I change the order of the adults and the kids, the subjects and the objects have changed too. The subjects are now the adults instead of the kids being the subjects, and the objects are now the kids instead of the adults being the objects. So the cross product is a lot like changing what the subjects and the objects can be depending on what the reference are in the real world. Uh, and similarly, sorry. Sorry, can you switch around the elements? The elements. Um, like, can you say zero A and then instead of saying zero B, can you say one A? One A, so if it's, if it's A cross B, I can do one A because if it's one A, this means that one has to come, sorry. Whatever the first element in the pair is has to come from that first set. So if it's one A, this means that the one has to come from a set where one originally is. So, so that would have to be A cross B because A comes from B and one comes from A. So that would have to be A cross B. Um, what I'm asking is, can you order the, the brackets, the, um, the Cartesian products in any way inside of the curly brackets? Like can oh, you yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So the order of these doesn't matter. So it could be 0A, zero 0B, zero or 0B, zero 0A. Zero 
um, because again, these are just sets. So the elements inside the sets don't matter, but the, the order within each of the pairs matters. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry for misunderstanding that. Um, and the last point right before the break is that if you, you can also do A cross A. So you can take the same set and you can do the cross product with itself. So I won't uh, illustrate this in terms of the notation because it's written right there. Um, but if you do the pairs, you just have to draw the same set twice and you could get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And you could also string this into A cross A cross A. And you could do the same thing and get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. Um, so it doesn't have to be separate sets here. Uh, anyways, we can now take a 10 minute break. And if you have any questions, you can uh, type them or save them for a voice chat after. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay, um, let's try a few practice questions here. Uh, there's no reason for us to do the fourth and fifth ones um, because they're not gonna be uh, seen in, uh, for our purposes on this course. Uh, they would be more just to test definitions, but again, they're not gonna be useful for us. So uh, let's just try K times L. Let's just illustrate these. So we can solve these just by drawing out our sets and finding all of the possible pairs. So for K times L, K is our set T, S, and P, and L is three and four. So if we wanna find uh, K times L, we can just draw these. So K has T, S, and P, L is three and four. And I mean, you don't need to draw these if you don't have to, but for the sake of illustration, why not? So this will be a set and the set will contain a bunch of pairs. It'll contain basically all possible combinations of things in K and L. So I think I can fit them all in there. Well, how do I know how many things are gonna be in there? Well, basically it'll be the number of things in K times the number of things in L. So there's three things in K and two things in L. If I multiply them together, I know there's gonna be six pairs total. So first of all is going to be uh, the pair T and three. So T and three will be there. We'll have T and four in our as a pair. So T three, T four. Uh, we'll have uh, S three and S four. That'll be another pair or another two pairs. And we'll have P three and P four. P3 and P4. So those will be our six pairs, T3, T4, S3, S4, and P3 and P4. And we can have those in any order. So it could be S3, P3, T3, uh, S4, P4, T4, and that would be fine as well. Um, but the T3 and T4 and S3, those have to be in order within the pairs because the first thing comes from K and the second thing comes from L. Okay. Uh, L and L times M is a little bit faster. So if you know what the pairs are in L times M, feel free to type those ones in the chat. Mm 
Three N and four N. Yeah. So this one's nice because there's only one thing in the set M and there's two things in the set L. So how many elements are we gonna have? Two times one, there's gonna be two pairs in total. Three N and four N. Okay. So yeah, the cross product isn't too bad, uh, but I did give you something a little bit nastier for the third part, uh, the power set of L cross M. And I gave you this question because uh, I just wanna show you how ugly the notation gets. And the fact that it's, it's okay to have an ugly notation. So let's do the power set of L cross M. And it's, it's the same process, it's the same process. Question is, do we add each element one by one? So do we add the pair 3n? If we say no, we're left with the empty set. But if we do add it, we're left with this set that contains 3n as an element. And then we ask our second question, do we add 4n. And we have two options here. We have no yes. We have no yes. So if no on the empty set, we're left with the empty set, which is nice. Uh, if yes, we have our element, our set containing 4n. Uh, if we don't add it to 3n, we're just left with the set containing 3n. And if we do add it to the set containing 3n, we're left with the set containing two pairs. Uh, 3n and 4n. Okay, and remember, each of these are going to be elements in our power set. So when we write the power set of L cross M, uh, what we're left with is the set containing, and I'm going to write these from right to left, uh, the empty set, uh, the set containing 4n, uh, the set containing the pair 3n and the set containing the pairs uh, 3n and 4n. So that would be the power set of L cross M. And I'm showing you this because there is a question similar to this on your assignment. And yes, it is a little bit ugly, um, but that's okay. Again, it's the same process as before. It's just the notation is cumbersome. But like in terms of natural language, this is like saying, um, you know, what are all the different combinations of subjects or of particular subjects and objects we could have for a sentence where there's like, uh, say, two possible subjects we could pick from and one possible object we could pick from. So it doesn't matter if N is repeated, you, we still write it as three N, four N. Yeah, uh, this is just all possible pairs. So um, in this case, the set M in our cross product only has one element to choose from, which is N in this case. So in all the possible pairs, N is the only thing to choose from as that second element. So N will be repeated. Um, in this case, it's not really N being repeated because these are all different pairs. So the pair itself is an element. So 4N is different from 3N. So 3n, 4n are different. We're not going into that pair and looking at those things separately. We're just treating 3n as one thing and 4n as a different thing. Okay, are there any questions about these three exercises? Okay, uh, so relations are where verbs come into play. So a relation is just a set of these n tuples. Um, but the difference between a relation and a Cartesian product or the n tuple in general is that uh, relations don't need all of them. When we just did Cartesian products, we got all of them, all of the possible pairs, but relations just need uh, however many that are relevant. So we can have 
unary relations. Uh, so these correspond to intransitive verbs. Things like uh, is a Ling 324 student is an example, or uh, sleeps would be another example. So the set, uh, this corresponds to like a set, a set of X such that X is a Ling 324 student. So this would be just the subjects, for example, the subjects in a sentence. Uh, you could have binary relations like loves or likes or hates or detests or eats, uh, the transitive eats. So these correspond to transitive verbs. So here you have uh, pairs, X, Y, such that X loves Y. So here you have a pair where you need a subject and you need an object. So if I say X loves Y, it might be like, uh, uh, I don't know, Carol loves Kelly. So you have one subject and one object. Uh, you could also have ternary relations. So these would be in uh, your diatransitive verbs. Uh, X gives Y to Z. So you have your subject, you have your uh, direct object. So I'll just call that a DO or you can call it your object one, and you could have your indirect object, uh, your object two. So ditransitive meaning three things. So, you know, uh, your triplets. So these are what relations are in terms of linguistics, in terms of natural language. Uh, formally, we usually give relations like a capital letter R, Usually because we're using verbs, I give them actual just names like gives or loves or is a Ling 324 student. But we say that relations are like a subset of A cross B. So basically, this is like saying um, this R is a transitive verb. In particular, so what I mean by is an by what I mean by R is a transitive verb in this case is that R is a subset of A cross B. So A cross B meaning there's two things that R comes from. Uh, one element comes from A and one element comes from B. It's looking for pairs in this case. And if a relationship holds, this means that it has a pair. So the pair AB is in the relationship R. So this is just uh, more abstract. Here's an actual example with natural language. So let's look at this example here. Suppose we have some relation. We're just calling this an abstract relation. I'm not going to use actual verb names here. Um, we're saying R is the subset of A cross A. So R is a relation looking for pairs X, Y, where X likes Y. So this is like a transitive verb looking for likers and likees. And A has two people in it, John and Mary. So basically we're looking at like this mini universe with two people, John and Mary, and we're looking at the verb likes. And here's a description of our little universe. Uh, John likes Mary, that's true. Uh, Mary does not like John, and both John and Mary like themselves. So I wanna write a description of this relation. So everything that's true, I put in the relation. So John likes Mary, so I write John Mary. And that's because in my description of the relation, I say these are all the pairs of X, Y, where X likes Y. So I'm looking for all the pairs of people where the first person likes the second. So because John likes Mary, I say that John and Mary are a pair. But Mary does not like John. So because Mary does not like John, I don't put Mary John in the relation. Uh, but both Ma John and Mary like themselves. So because John likes John, I put John, John in the relation. Uh, because Mary likes herself, I put Mary, Mary in the relation. So my relation here consists of John, Mary, John, John, and Mary, Mary. And that's because John likes Mary, John likes John, and Mary likes Mary. So that's an example of a relation, like a formal relation. So I've taken this real life example and I put it into mathematical notation. Uh, so is everyone okay with that description of taking a real life example and putting it into mathematical notation? Yeah. 
Do you uh, do you have to have a name for the relations? Like is Ling three, two four student or loves or gives? Uh, I've just given those names here, so that way we can you know actually think of them in terms of concrete language. But like in this example, I've just used R. So you can just use a capital letter or you can give it a name that actually has meaning. Uh, it's up to you and it's up to however the question's worded. Typically, I try to give them real names because we work with language. Okay, um, so these are two, two quick things I'm gonna go over. Uh, these work just like sets. Uh, if you have a relation, R, you can also talk about its complement. So uh, if we talked about the complement on the previous page, we talked about all the people that like them or that like, like the like relation, X likes Y. So John, Mary, John, John, Mary, Mary. If we talk about the complement, that would be all the people that do not like each other. So all the people that, all the pairs that were not in that original relation. So in that case, we said that Mary does not like John. So then that would consist of Mary John if we were to think about the complement. So the complement of a relation is just like the complement of a set. And you'll see that the definition is quite similar. So I won't spend too much time talking about that. That's pretty much as far as we'll go. Uh, the inverse is a new operator that we see for relations. Uh, the inverse is written with a little negative one on top, as you can see here. And basically what the inverse does is it takes all of the pairs, A, B, and it just flips the order of them. So if you have A, B in the original relation, then in the inverse, we just flip them so they're all B, A. So uh, for example, if we have John, Mary and R, then in our inverse, we would have Mary, John. If we have John, John and R, then our inverse, we would have John, John. Uh, so it's trivial in that case, because when we flip them, they're the same. Uh, but the inverse just flips the pair. So for example, uh, here we have greater. Greater has three, two, three, one, and two, one. Uh, let's not worry about greater complement, but let's think about greater inverse. Uh, what would be greater inverse? Well, we're just going to take all of these pairs and we're going to flip them. So greater inverse would have uh, 2, 3, because we're going to flip 3, 2 and make it 2, 3. Uh, we're going to flip 3, 1 and we're going to make it 1, 3. And we're going to flip 2, 1 and make it 1, 2. So greater inverse becomes two, three, one, three, and one, two. And we can ask ourselves, uh, how is the meaning changed? Uh, if greater sort of represented the greater than sign, and now we made it as inverse, uh, what is the new meaning? So we used to have three greater than two, three greater than one, two greater than one, and now we have this uh, two, three, one, three, one, two, we've sort of given it a different meaning. We've given it a less than meaning by, get, by doing the inverse here. So again, more of a math example that I don't want to harp on too much, but uh, this is one of the operations we can do with an inverse. And we can see this in natural language too. I think on your homework, uh, on, on your second assignment, there's one example of an inverse with natural language that you'll get to work with. So just to demonstrate that, yes, questions. So the relations doesn't have to have all the elements. A relation does not need to have all the elements. A relation just basically can describe any situation in the real world. So um, for instance, you can have a relation of everyone, of, of all the pairs of people who are taller than each other. So you would only list the people who are the only, you would only list the pairs of people who are taller than each other. So if there's five people, um, you know, not everybody can be taller than each other. There'd be one person who's taller than four other people, one person who's taller than three other people, maybe a couple people are the same height. You might have a relation where 
uh, the loves relationship with 10 people and maybe nobody in that group loves each other. It could be the empty set in a relation. That's also possible. Okay. So that's how we can set up relations and that's how we can think about them in terms of verbs, but we can think about properties of relations too. Uh, so there's formal ways to talk about properties. I like to think about pictures and descriptions. Um, and we're just gonna talk about three. We're gonna talk about reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And here are the pictures. And we have some formal definitions here, but again, the pictures uh, are enough. So imagine we just have say a group of people and uh, let's think about the word loves. And let's just say there's there's two people. This is this is the best I can do in terms of drawing. So those are two people. And we're just give them numbers because I can't draw faces, person one and person two. Okay. We say that a relation is reflexive if each element of that relation, like it sorry. So we'll say that each of these people are, are in a set. So if we have the set A, uh, one is in that set A and two is in that set A and the relation is the relation loves. So we'll say that loves is in A cross A. Should be a little bit more specific than what I just gave you. Okay, so if, if we know that loves consists of one, one, and two, two. So if each of those people love themselves, then we say that the relation is reflexive. So if every person in that relation loves themselves, if every person love in that set loves themselves, then it's reflexive. So if A loves themselves and B loves themselves and C loves themselves, it's reflexive. Everybody has to. If at least one person does not love themselves, then the relation is not reflexive. So for example, in this case with just one and two, if loves only consisted of one, one, if only one loves himself, then the relation is not reflexive. So you can think of reflexivity in terms of syntax. So uh, reflexive pronouns like uh, himself or themselves or uh, yourself. The, this self suffix is called the reflexive suffix. So reflexivity in mathematics means the same thing. It's to yourself. So in a relation, if every single object in that set is in a relation with itself, then the relation is reflexive. So we can diagram that with an arrow pointing to itself. So actually I think what I'll do is if we remember that uh, relation from earlier with John and Mary, we'll actually keep that example through this one. I'm gonna illustrate this. So I'm gonna use circles. Basically what I do is I use a circle for each person and I use arrows. So if I remember, uh, John liked himself, Mary liked himself, uh, John liked Mary, but Mary didn't like John. So this is how I illustrate that relation. So we can ask ourselves, um, is this relation reflexive? And yeah, uh, this relation is reflexive because both John and Mary like themselves. Everybody in that set like themselves, so it's a reflexive relation. Uh, what about this next property called symmetry? Uh, the way that symmetry works is that if, if you have a relation where one element is related to another, so if you have A in a relationship with B, then you must have it the other way around. So it's a condition. If you have one pointing to the other, then you have to have the other one pointing back. So we can ask ourselves in this John Mary case, is it symmetric? 
uh, we have John liking Mary. So if it is symmetric, we have to have the other case backwards. We have to have Mary liking John too, but we don't have that. So in this case, uh, this relation is not symmetric because we don't have Mary liking John. Um, but imagine you have, say, two people, and I don't know, this person, it, both of them are 10 years old. And you have this relation that is, uh, is the same age as. And we know that person A is the same age as person B. We also know that person B is the same age as person A. That could be an example of a symmetric relation because A is related to B and B is related to A because they're both the same age. So that could be an example of a symmetric relation. I'm sorry, could you go a couple slides back? I, I had a question about it. A uh, couple slides back? This one? Yes. So for the example at the bottom of the page, can we have bracket Mary John or can we not have that? Um, I mean, we could if we had the situation with Mary John. Um, in this particular description, though, we have the relation set up as people who like each other. And in this description, Mary does not like John. So we don't include it. Um, but we could define a relation where Mary likes John and we could include Mary John um, if we set up the, the world differently. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the final one is transitivity. Uh, transitivity, I think, is the easiest to think about in terms of numbers. If we had to name all the combinations, we would include that, right? Um, if we had to name all the combinations, we would include that, right? Yes, if you had to. If you had to, there would be so few people included in the relation that you could do it. Yeah. If there were a ton of people in the relation, you would not have to. That, that, that would be a hint that you wouldn't have to. Yeah, so this last one here is transitivity. So I want to show you this in terms of numbers first, and then we'll try to find something in natural language where this works. Okay, so transitivity says that if you have a relation from A to B, and you have a relation from B to C, essentially, you can take a shortcut from A to C. So if A is related to B and B is related to C, then you know there's a relationship from A to C. And we saw this last week with uh, subsets. So we said if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then we saw that A was a subset of C. So that's one example of transitivity. Here's another thing. Uh, if we know that say some number A is less than the number B and some number B is less than the number C, then we know for sure that whatever number A was has to be less than C. Uh, so just for any particular example, if two is less than four and four is less than seven, then yeah, two has to be less than seven. Uh, these are all examples of transitivity in mathematics. And uh, I mean, this can be the same with age too. If you have three people and person one is younger than person two and person two is younger than person three, uh, unless you unlock time travel or some, you know, anti-aging nonsense, uh, person one is going to be younger than person three. A grandchild will always be younger than the grandmother. Uh, well, in like 99.9% .9 of all cases. So uh, that's an example of transitivity. So yeah, um, like in, in, in any, uh, any numeric property with less than, uh, greater than 
it's, it's going to work with transitivity. So, you know, things you shouldn't talk about, like weight, uh, age, are, are really good in terms of transitivity for, for comparing properties of people. Unfortunately, those are the best examples, but uh, yeah, that, that can work. So uh, I think the best way really is, is to think about this in terms of actual words. So let's just, let's just try some examples, but I guess first I gotta, I gotta show the, the big bulky one. So let's show the equivalence relation. The equivalence relation is basically when you have a relation that has all three of the things we talked about, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive at the same time. And basically this boils down to in natural language to something like is the same as, or is equivalent, or is equal to, uh, or something that expresses the same thing as above. So when I did the thing earlier is the same age. Uh, if we put in, say, everyone is 10 years old, we can ask ourselves a few things like, is this relationship uh, reflexive? So is everyone the same age as themselves? Yes, everyone is the same age as themselves. If I am 10, then I am 10. I am the same age as myself. Uh, so uh, like I'm 28. So I'm 28, I'm the same age as myself. Uh, if I'm the same age as another 28-year-old, then they're going to be the same age as me. Uh, if I'm the same age as another 28-year-old and they're the same age as another 28-year-old, then I'm going to be the same age as that third 28-year-old. Like it's, uh, you know, when you're the same as someone else, it's going to be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So is the same blank? These are what are called equivalence relations. And uh, the word equivalence is in the word. So equal, the same as, equivalent. Uh, it's sort of a key word in linguistics that for some reason, when you hear it in math courses, that's never put in the, put in the spotlight for some odd reason. But uh, that's an equivalence relation, something that is reflexive, transitive, and symmetric. So I think it's best to practice these in terms of words, in terms of verbs and prepositions, well, these verb preposition combos, we can just think of them as verbs, that's okay. So I want you to think of each of these and ask yourselves, so symmetric, reflexive, transitive. Uh, for things like familial relationships, uh, don't think too deeply or wildly about these. Um, I, I know things can get very complicated uh, with like divorces and, uh, you know, uh, half siblings and things like that. Uh, try to think like a, a really boring family from the 1940s uh, just to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, but ask yourself things like, uh, is a sister of? Uh, can you be a sister of yourself? If you have one sibling and you're a sister of that sibling, does that sibling have to be a sister of you? Uh, if you have two siblings and you're a sister of one and that sibling is a sister of another, are you going to be a sister to that third? So for each of these, uh, try to ask yourself, are these relationships necessarily reflexive, necessarily symmetric, necessarily transitive? Uh, and just think about these ones. And if you have any questions, as always, feel free to type them in chat or talk over voice. I'll give you four minutes or so to actually think about these ones because uh, these are good exercises. So I will see you in four minutes for the solutions for these ones.
Okay, feel free to keep working, but I'm going to launch a poll and you can choose multiple answers for each of these. I just wanna see what you're thinking for each of these. Uh, and if you didn't finish, you can always choose DNF for each of the questions. So if you only finish two or three, don't feel bad if you feel, uh, pick DNF. Again, these aren't for marks, they're just for um, immediate feedback. Okay. See how this is. So nobody chose reflexive for is a sister of. That's good. Um, you cannot be a sister of yourself. Again, not in a simple world without time travel or body splitting. Uh, is it symmetric? Um, okay, so this is this is okay so what i've asked you to do here is basically think of relations um in terms of like necessarily reflexive so you do have to think of different possible cases which in terms of four minutes i, I know is very tough so you don't have a lot of time to think about this so if you did not think about these cases it's completely understandable uh it is possible of course uh, for you to be a sister of, say, someone who is male or non-binary or uh, someone else. So uh, you could be a sister to someone and they could be a brother to you. So it's not necessarily symmetric. Uh, it could be symmetric, but not necessarily. Uh, it is possible if there are two sisters. So there could be some instance where it is symmetric, but it doesn't have to be symmetric. So not in all cases is it symmetric. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is just practice. So like if, if it's a case where you're thinking, oh, there's is there one case where it's symmetric? Yeah, there's one case where it's symmetric. So if you chose it based on one case, that's, that's fine. Yes, that's correct. But in all cases, no. Uh, in terms of transitivity though, yes, in all cases, it would be transitive. So if you're a sister to someone, and they're a sister to someone else, and there's no half brothers, half sisters, divorcees, or whatever. Then yes, uh, if you're a sister to someone else, then you're going to be a sister to that third person as well because you're all related. So the first one was done very well. Uh, a mother of, uh, you cannot be a mother of yourself. Um, if you're a mother to your kid, they cannot be the mother to you. Um, yeah, that cannot happen. Uh, and if you are a mother to someone and they're a mother to someone else, then typically we don't say that you're the mother to your kid's kid. We'd say you're the grandmother. So we would say that's not transitive. Uh, I don't know if that's consistent across every culture, every language. Maybe some languages say that's the mother as well. So that could be language dependent. Uh, but in English, we would say that's a grandmother, not a mother. So we'd say that's not transitive. So typically, we'd say it's none for two. Uh, is the same age as? This is all three. So... Yeah, if I, I'm always going to be the same age as myself. Uh, if I'm the same age as my friend, then this, my friend will be the same age as me. And if we have, uh, you know, three people and 
let's say I'm age X and I'm the same age as my friend who's age X and my friend is the same age as someone else who's age X, then clearly we all have to be the same age. So yeah, uh, same age will be transitive. This is an equivalence relation. So the same is sort of the key there, the same age. That's an equivalence relation. So equivalence relations will always be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Uh, finally, likes. Um, this is one of those cases, again, where I guess the question, again, maybe not specified as clearly as it could. And again, on your assignments and on tests, it is specified specific to a universe. In this question, it wasn't specified very well. Um, but um, in every particular case, it is not necessary that someone likes themselves. So there are particular cases where, yes, people will like themselves. So it could be reflexive. But in every possible world, it's not necessary that it's reflexive because you could have people that don't like themselves. Uh, similarly, um, I could really like someone and they could hate me. So it's not necessarily symmetric. But there are many cases out there where, yeah, you'll like someone and they'll like you back. And that could be symmetric in that case. Um, uh, transitive. Uh, maybe I really like my friend and my friend really likes her drug dealer, but I really can't stand the drug dealer. So uh, I don't, it's not transitive in that case because I don't like my friend's friend. I, I use the drug dealer example just to really emphasize uh, not liking a friend's friend. Usually gets a better emotional response than just saying a friend's friend, but uh, it's not necessarily transitive. So yeah, there are all there are particular universes and particular scenarios and constructions where likes can be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, but in general, it's not necessarily required. It's not necessary that these are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So yeah, on assignments and on tests, I give you particular universes where I tell you everyone who's in the set, and I give you very specific relations and tell you who likes who, um, you know, who's the same weight, the same age, and all that kind of stuff. So that way you know what's going on and you can analyze it piece by piece. Um, this was more general. Uh, so uh, you should be able to do every question on assignment two except for that 0.5% final question in learning and reinforcement about functions. Uh, we will cover that in the first 20 minutes on, uh, what day is it today? It's Tuesday. So on Friday. Um, so That'll be really quick. Uh, it's not that in depth of a problem. So you won't have too long to do that, unfortunately, before the assignments do, but we will get that done on Friday. Sorry for taking a little bit longer uh, to get that done. I'll send out an email tonight about the practice questions for set laws and the solution for that one. Um, and if there are any questions, again, I have office hours on Wednesday and uh, the TA is available too after 4.30. So don't forget to contact her if you want extra help as well. And on Friday, you'll be able to do the practice exercises for relations and functions too. So if there are any questions, I will hang out in the Zoom call um, right now, if you have any. Um, so stick around. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll see you on Friday.